Hi, you're listening to the IT Forge News Digest. The summer break is over, engineers are back at work, which honestly makes my life easier. Now there are so many new projects and announcements, I can barely fit them into one episode. I'm already stashing stories for the next show, and who knows, maybe it's time to switch to Weekly Digest. But for now, I'm still trying to keep each episode easy to digest, about 10 minutes long. If you'd prefer deep dives, let me know. Drop a comment on YouTube or just the chat in our Telegram channel. All the links are on itforge.io. Alright, let's dive in. I'm your host, Pavel Korshinov. Today's Tuesday, September 2nd, and this is our 17th episode. Picture this. You roll up to a drive-in and place an order. I will take a micro-manipulator to maskless lithography, maybe some localized electroplating for micro 3D printing, or and a side of focus tacking for imaging, and micro-machining, and can I get pattern scoring with that? And the speaker answers. Sure things. They'll be 50 nanometers precision, uh, mostly 3D printed, powered by cheap NEMA 70 motors, open source. Yes, you got it. This is exactly what Diffraction Limited Channel just released, an open source 3D motion platform with 50 nanometers precision. They shown how it works in their video, talks through the challenges and highlights what open source makes possible. Electromechanical engineers will admire the obsessive attention to detail. ASMR fans might enjoy the build stage, the careful placement of parts, the glue, the satisfying screw turns. 3D printing folks will crack a smile when Otto runs a bench G code, except here it's controlling a microscope stage, squeezed into a 20 micron envelope, hypnotic to watch. And of course, open source enthusiasts will love the fact that everything is published and hackable. It's a brilliant reminder. Open source isn't just about software, it's also about precision hardware, built together, shared together. Overall, 25 minutes of pure engineering joy. Exactly what we've been missing in the Gen AI era. Have you ever wondered if a 20 micron banshee could fit an elephant? Turns out, yes! if that elephant is just 10 microns tall. Researchers at the Joseph Stefan Institute in Slovenia have actually 3D printed a rising elephant inside a living cell. That's right, a full model elephant 0.01 mm long created with a laser through the wall of a cell. Now, we've talked before, back in episode 9, about printing inside the body using liposomes and ultrasound to trigger polymerization. But this time the approach was different. The team injected a tiny blob of resin into a cell with a fine glass tube. Then they used two photon polymerization, TPP, an optical technique with a femtosecond laser that can scan in 100 nanometers layers. In seconds, the resin solidified into the shape of, well, an elephant, straight out of the Tinkercad shape library. What's mind-blowing here is the precision. The laser can print complex structure inside the living cell without destroying it. And after the leftover resin is absorbed, the printed object stays put, even larger than the tube they started with. And while this sounds like a fun, tiny elephant in a cell demo, the real applications are huge. Imagine printing custom scaffolding or microtex QR code-like markers that could track individual cells, even after they divide. I can't pretend to fully grasp the medical horizon here, but the engineering, a near-infrared femtosecond laser, building 3D structures, at the scales of life itself, that's just astonishing. But the follow big drop from Bumble Lab is more friendly to ordinary people like you and me. Meet the H2S, 
their biggest single nozzle printed yet. Build volume 340 x 320 x 340 mm. That's more than double the X1C and is fast. A full meter per second with acceleration that leaves the X1C about 30% behind. Hot end goes to 350 degrees Celsius, chamber to 65. So you are printing carbon fiber and engineering plastics without the usual warping. And the brains? 23 sensors, 3 cameras. It basically babysits itself overnight. Inside you've got a beefy new servo motor with way more extrusion force, optional visual encoder for industrial level accuracy, and even automatic hole compensation, so parts actually fit first try. If you go for the laser full combo, you also get engraving, cutting and drawing wrapped in a safety packed glass enclosure. And just to spice things up, Bamboo teased the H2C, that's their multicolor future. The trick? Swappable hot ends. No wires, no plugs, all wireless with inductive heating. Each hot end weighed just 10 grams, about the size of a thumb. The challenge is micrometer level repeatability, but they're solving it. So bottom line, H2S is here, bigger, faster, smarter. H2C is coming, wireless, colorful, and worth to wait. Well, it's time to shift gears from hardware to software. ESP Home 2025.8 release brings a lot, but I personally want to stop on two new features. First, support for the NRF52 platform. ESP Home is no longer just about ESP32 and ESP8266. Now it fully supports Nordic NRF52 microcontrollers running on Zephyr RTOS. That's a pretty big deal. Why? Because Zephyr isn't just another real-time operation system. It's open, flexible and gives developers powerful tools for Bluetooth and NFC devices. With this update, ESP Home users can now configure analog to digital converters, GPIOs and even advanced debugging features through Zephyr. In other words, low-power Nordic boards like the NRF52840 now fit right into your ESP Home projects. And this is just the start. It lays the foundation for the next generation of Nordic chips like the NRF54 series to join the ecosystem. I have a couple of Nordic 52840 boards and I can't wait to try out the new feature. Second, mesh networking with ESP Now. Espressive's ESP Now protocol is now baked into ESP Home. That means devices can talk directly to each other, no Wi Fi router in the middle. The result? Low latency and ultra-low power consumption. You get the full tool set here. Send and broadcast packets, listen for incoming ones, auto-add peers, even choose a channel you want to use. And the real magic shown up in the field. There is a story on Reddit of a tiny ESP01 running on a single 8650 cell. It wakes up every 15 minutes, fires of data via ESP now in about 150 milliseconds and goes back to sleep. That little guy ran for 10 months on one charge. And now building the bridge between ESP now and your home automation is easy. So if you are building battery powered sensors, light control or local command system, ESP home and ESP now makes flexible autonomous mesh network not just possible, but practical. And that wraps up this episode of the IoT Forge News Digest. Next time we'll dig into fresh releases from Raspberry Pi and Nvidia, so stay tuned. If you haven't yet, hit subscribe on YouTube or follow us on your favorite podcast app, so you don't miss what's next in IoT. Thanks for listening. And I'll catch you in the next one.